Welcome to the March 2024 webinar of the Institute for Independent Journalists on insurance and managing risks as a freelancer. I'm Katherine Reynolds Lewis, the founder of the Institute for Independent Journalists, and I'm really thrilled to be here because this is a question that we get a lot, whether it's health insurance or managing the risk of a lawsuit or planning for your future. Uh, risk management and insurance is so important for independent journalists because we don't have an institution backing us up. And some of the recent incidents that have happened um, are potentially really scary for those of us working um, solo. Uh, for example, the idea that you might be sued by an angry source, even if it's frivolous, the cost of defending that lawsuit could really put you out of business just take freelancer Lisa Kwan, who's really important coverage of illegal Airbnbs for Knock LA led to a lawsuit from a landlord who was really upset about her coverage. And even though she ultimately prevailed, she ended up with more than $10,000 in legal fees that um, the organization she freelanced for would not cover and, and wouldn't also um, join in her defense or couldn't. Um, so we want to always make sure that is as independent business owners, we are protecting ourselves. And this session, these amazing panelists are going to help us do that. So I'm gonna to switch to gallery mode so you can see everyone as I introduce them. I'm really excited to have with this Rafael Espinal, a proud Brooklyn native of Dominican descent, who was elected to the New York State Assembly at the age of 26 and later served on the City Council of New York City where he championed workers' rights, affordable housing, environmental initiatives. He became the executive director of the Freelancers Union in 2020, where he now focuses on advocating for all of us, as well as folks who are freelancing in other fields. Uh, really happy to have you with us here and excited to, as always, partner, collaborate with the Freelancers Union. Thank you, thank you so much. Cheryl L. Davis is general counsel of the Authors Guild, another organization I love as an author, where she oversees the organization's legal affairs, including in-house corporate affairs and management of literary estates. She's also active around book banning and diversity and writes about um, and participates in thought leadership on all of these topics. Um, she is a screenwriter and holds a uh, AB from Princeton and JD and MSJ from Columbia. So she's super impressive. Lots of leadership roles that you can see in her bio um, in the chat. And last but definitely not least, Maithili Sampath Kumar is a freelancer based in New York with bylines in several news outlets covering US politics, climate change, tech education, and many stories in between, as so many of us do, uh, covering a lot. She mostly runs newsletters and also is an editor now. She's a former staff reporter at The Independent, former contractor with both Facebook and Twitter's news curation teams. Uh, may they may, may the they rest in peace <laughs> and very active on the board of the South Asian Journalists Association and President Emeritus. So thank you for your service to our broader community of freelancers and journalists of color, Maithili, and thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm going to switch back to speaker view, which will help us spotlight the person speaking. So let's start just talking broadly about the risks that independent journalists face with regard to all of the risks we like to, you know, make sure we're covered on health, safety, legal liability, economic risk, and start with Maithili, how have you navigated some of these risks over the course of your career and how has that changed? Um, I think at the beginning, when I was first starting out, I started out as a freelancer um, because I was still new to journalism and I was switching careers. I had been working at law firms before that. Um, the only thing that I was worried about was financial risk. <laughs> I'll be completely honest. Um, and it wasn't so much risk in terms of how it was tied to legal issues. It was mostly just risk purely based on what I needed to pay and what I was making. Um, and I think a lot of us are like that for a number of years until something happens or we hear about something and then we're like, oh crap, I have to make sure that I'm I'm taking care of this. Um, but then, you know, you start to think about health insurance. And so obviously a lot of us have um, 
you know, Obamacare insurance or or we're on a partner's insurance plan. Um, and then there's, you know, I was traveling quite a bit at one point in my career doing stories all over the world. And I wasn't going to particularly dangerous places, but, you know, there were places I didn't know. I didn't know anyone there before I, I landed to do these stories. Um, and so that's when I started thinking about other types of risk, like, okay, it's not just health insurance when I'm home, it's traveling abroad, you know, my parents are older, so they can't, they're not necessarily mobile or able to help in, in terms of, of, you know, they can't fly out and come get me. <laughs> um, so it's traveler's insurance. Um, and then what fi I finally came to liability insurance a few years ago when I started working for a client that required it. And they were the first client I ever had in my career that specifically said, we need you to have liability insurance as part of your contract. Um, and that's when I, I started thinking about that. Great, thank you. And I know we'll get into the details of some of those policies later. Um, Cheryl, I'd love to hear your perspective on some of the legal issues specific to independent journalists just in the course of doing our jobs. So what are some of the things we might be sued for even if we didn't do anything wrong and how can you manage those risks? Well, one of the top uh, areas of concern is of course defamation, libel and slander, uh, which relates to false statements that are made about a person, they need, the person needs to be uh, specifically identifiable uh, and the person needs to be harmed. Uh, but one thing I wanna, I wanna stress is that it's not necessarily that you're, you're deliberately making a false statement. Even in, factual errors can still be false statements and you may still be sued and held liable in those situations. Uh, so in, in terms of defamation, these people get sued when they make a false statement that they, and, and also, these laws are, are state laws. So I'm going to be talking primarily about how we interpret it in New York. So in New York, uh, you have to have made a false statement that you knew or had reason to know was false. So there's a negligence standard there. So essentially, it's trying to compel or encourage journalists to uh, behave in a reasonable and professional manner in terms of investigating. So you can't just like accept the word of like this guy standing outside the street, it's out on the street in front of pointing at the building saying, I know the owner of this building and I know he's a crook. I'm like, really? So there's uh, libel and defamation. Uh, and also when you're reporting on uh, public figures and public officials, there actually is a different standard of liability. It's called actual malice. And that's under the New York Times v. Sullivan standard. And that's something we want to, uh, in the journalist industry, keep an eye on because, unfortunately, while this this principle has been in place since 1964 and the Supreme Court has held it, uh, there are states and actually members of our U.S. Supreme Court who feel that maybe this actual malice standard is really not necessary. Maybe we ought to loosen it up a little bit. So in Florida, they were, there were some bills that were on the table that they were trying to loosen and trying to soften the actual malice standard, the New York Times v. Sullivan, and said, we got to keep an eye on that because there's probably somebody's trying to lay a trap and lay start a lawsuit that will enable this current SCOTUS to reassess Times v. Sullivan the same way they reassess Roe v. Wade. Uh, so there are also, oh, um, invasion of privacy. Uh, is also a potential area in which somebody might be sued. Again, you got to look at the state that you're in and your specific laws and if there are any statutes in that, in that jurisdiction. But so they look at that things like, was there a reasonable expectation of privacy that you have invaded? Uh, they also look at false light. If somebody has portrayed, uh, uh, disclosed information that portrays someone in a false or misleading light. But they also often have an exclusion where it says that if the information is an is not an area of public concern, if it is an area of public concern, then it's less likely that you're going to be found guilty of casting somebody in a false light. Uh, there's also uh, unintentional or in New York, we call it negligent infliction of emotional distress. And again, it looks to what you were doing in terms of what did your disclosures uh, cause someone mental distress? And if it was done in a negligent way, then yes, you may be sued and found liable in that situation. And those are some of the areas in which journalists might be might be found liable and might be subject to lawsuit. 
Wow, I feel like my heart rate is already up. <laughs> Just <laughs> I, I, and I used to cover copyright law and media companies, and I did not realize there were so many differences state to state. So um, let's mm -hmm. try and get into that a little bit later. I'd like to. Well, understand. copyright is a federal law. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but these other ones are these. They, they go. The states run the gamut, and they have their own laws, and they have their own case law interpreting even if the statute doesn't necessarily say something the, the pattern of case law may establish exactly what is required to find somebody liable under these particular claims and does it tend to be the jurisdiction where the publication is based or where the journalist is based how do you determine the venue well often people will try to forum shop but the people it, you can sue where the where the publication is based often people try to sue um, as i'm the plaintiff this is where i'm injured and clearly you're doing business here because you've hurt me, but people engage in forum shopping and try to get a case held and found, heard in this jurisdiction most favorable to them. But there are arguments on several different sides, especially when you're dealing with something like internet journalism, uh, you're potentially opening yourself up to at least an initial attack in jurisdiction that you may not have expected. Right, right. And you can ask to have it transferred, but. You're, you're publishing everywhere. <laughs> So Raphael, um, we'd love to hear from you about some of the ways that Freelancers Union helps your members manage possible risks or problems with specifically health or financial security. Um, what's the range of uh, services or resources you provide? Definitely. Well, well thank you for having me. Um, I, so I, I would say that as an organization, we're, we represent independent workers across all in different industries. And we try to find that common thread uh, that everyone shares, and that's usually financial or health and insurance, right? Um, and so it's really become at the core of what the organization does. And can, so because of that, we deeply understand what the unique challenges are, uh, especially when it comes to, to both of those topics. And we know that being a freelancer is very challenging, uh, especially because you lack those traditional employment benefits you'll get if you work for someone, you know, as, as was mentioned earlier, you know, have, having to to purchase a liability insurance to work with certain companies. You know, if you're a staff writer, that you you're 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 already protected by those insurances that those companies have. Um, so one of the one of the most recent uh, partnerships that that we're we're excited about and like really proud of is with this company called Opolis, uh, and they are a worker cooperative, right? And at the surface, they are a payroll platform, but it's really a comprehensive ecosystem designed to support freelancers. So it not only provides you with a payroll system for yourself, but it also gives you proof of income, right? Which also which becomes an issue a lot if you're trying to secure a mortgage or 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 or, or a rental apartment. Uh, help it, it gives you access to like premium group health benefits and also uh, retirement saving options, um, and it really allows you to focus on your work as a writer and not have to focus on the back end administrative work uh, that usually comes with working independently. Uh, so it's it's a really fairly simple process. So like all you have to do is um, go on the Freelancers Union website, uh, and you'll find the Opolis uh, page under our insurance page, and you're able to you you'll the first step is that it'll 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 force you to create an LLC or, or S or C corp, right, which formalizes you as a business, and then they run your payroll right for you, uh, and you're able to choose how much you want to pay yourself on a biweekly basis uh, while you bring the income in. Um, and when and when you're when you're when you're able to um, put that get that system in place and in order, then it opens you up um, to the benefits, right? So you'll have access to premium medical, dental, vision, life, disability, uh, alongside unemployment and insurance and workers' compensation, right? Uh, and the way that works is that they now act as if they're your employer, even though you are working for yourself. Um, and then at the end of the year, you also are free are free from worrying about your taxes, right? So you don't no longer have to worry about the quarterly taxes because the system is actually um, uh, pu you know pulling the taxes out, out of out of the your your paycheck they've created for yourself. Uh, at the end of the year, you know, you know you're, you're, it's very clear where your tax obligations are going to be, given that you you've created the system for yourself within within the platform. So again, you know, to opt in. You go on our website, and it's about twenty dollars uh, a year uh, to 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 join the platform. But that twenty dollars is not a simple membership fee. It really uh, what it does is makes you a part owner of the cooperative. So you get like a one percent share uh, in common stock as well. Um, and uh, you know you also uh, when 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 the common stock and and the 
and the dividends are paid out. You do receive some of that through the payroll system you created for yourself. And it's, and it's a, again, it's really a partnership that, that we saw advantageous because, you know, as an organization, we try to find ways and, you know, why we work, while we work pushing government and pushing policy that expands the rights and protections of workers, we also try to search for, you know, so, uh, social entrepreneurial companies that are doing the work to fill that gap where, where it's needed. And I think we all agree, especially now, independent workers uh, 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 are, are growing and they, they are desperately in need of, of these simple protections to ensure they get paid on time, that they have access to health care, they can care for their family, et cetera, et cetera. So willing to talk more about it, but uh, encourage everyone to check it out. It's, it's really, truly, uh, I think, a transformative program. Great. Yeah, especially right now, um, I think having a W-2 to show to a mortgage lender with the housing market being what it is uh, can really be helpful. And <clears throat> Raphael, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I did actually explore because I was interested in um, potentially benefiting from Opolis. So I had like nice. a take call with their um, their team and they said roughly um, around forty fifty thousand dollars $50,000 of income a year is when it can make sense to elect to be paid as an S corporation. And then you really can have steady payroll and benefit from not paying your self-employment taxes. Um, so I thought that was another, for folks yep. who aren't familiar with S corp versus C corp, um, it's this off, continual debate about which you should elect to. And I, it seems like a very streamlined way. And I believe they said it's about, um, do they charge 1% of payroll that they process? Do you know, Raphael? One, one, yes, it's 1%, sorry, of the payroll. Yeah. They do do that. Right. So that's a lot cheaper than hiring mm -hmm. uh, someone to do payroll for you. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I will add that this is available for members, for folks across all 50 states. Um, there, there are some income restrictions uh, on when you can opt into the health insurance plans that they have. And that's, again, federally and state mandated that they have to follow. Uh, but that number is different in every state. So I encourage everyone to check it out. Great. And um, then those are like health, vision, dental, group policies mm -hmm. that you right. just pay extra for? Exactly. Exactly. And I think, you know, and, you know, health insurance was brought up earlier as well. And one, you know, one thing, one issue we've been hearing from a lot of freelancers is that uh, those that opt in into the marketplace and, and they get the, the, this, this single, this, this single, they get the, the, the individual plans with, with the carriers. There are a lot of doctors that don't want to, don't want to, uh, take that insurance because they see it as as a risk, right? They're, because it's not backed by a large employer, they're not they 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 have a concern that you're not that may, maybe you as a freelancer are not paying your health insurance uh, plan that month, and because of that, they may be liable for whatever cost they incur. So it really creates a another hurdle. Um, so going into Opolis uh, just creates that that extra layer of protection and opens you up to a more premium experience if you're going to purchase health insurance. Great. Um, wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing that, Raphael. And I did put in the chat links and we'll also share links in when we send out the recording after um, as well. So I often say like risk, the flip side of risk is opportunity. When we uh, enter into contracts involving our creative works as journalists, we may not recognize that we're giving up opportunity, whether that's the opportunity to syndicate our work in the future, make more money from that, or create a book or a Netflix series or podcast based on our on our creative work, um, unless we really understand the copyright and licensing terms in our contracts. So I'd love to turn to Cheryl to talk a bit about the importance of retaining copyrights to your work. And um, especially as we're making, we're seeing with all the layoffs in media right now, a lot of people new to freelancing who are used to being an employee and don't recognize how differently they're, they could be treated as a freelancer. Uh, that is, and that is the, the, really the point, Catherine, is that as an employee, your work is deemed to be uh, work made for hire. It means that your employer owns the copyright and everything that you create on your job. And that's just pretty much normal and expected. But when you become a freelancer, there are there are clients who may want to have that same sort of arrangement say well you're writing this for me i should own it and as a freelancer and this is something we recommend at the authors guild for independent authors is that we recommend that they hold on to their copyrights and there are people who may say that well but i don't plan on republishing it so why do i care well you care because uh one it gives you leverage in terms of being able to prevent somebody from marketing and using your work in a way you don't expect 
And two, it enables you to actively go out and market your work and have derivative works made out of it. There are, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the entertainment industry, pretty much IP is the term of the day. Intellectual, pre-existing intellectual property is very desirable. And people are looking to articles. They're looking to long form journalism. They're looking to all sorts of stories that have gotten public attention and they're adapting them into work like inventing Anna. And all these, and I think even the few film Saturday Night Fever was based on a brief article. Mean I think Girls Top, was based uh, Top on Gun an or something. Yeah. Mean Girls was based on an article. You know, yes. the surf movie was based on an article. <laughs> And if you're the writer of that article, uh, we feel that you should be the one in a, licensing those rights to Hollywood or to producers or et cetera. So when you're, be, be cautious when you're signing on to agreements with clients. If they automatically state that, oh, we get the copyright, and then as much as you feel able to, push back and say, no, I'm going to give you an exclusive uh, for license for uh, to issue it, to publish it, and you can republish it in your, in, in your uh, format. But I want to retain the copyright and I want to retain the ability to license it in other formats to other organizations. Okay, wonderful. Um, yes, I always, always, always negotiate my contracts. I don't always win, but I at least try because you got to try. You know, obviously, I wrote a book based on an article that I wrote for Mother Jones and. I've covered the same topic for multiple different publications. And if you're not looking at your contract terms, that could be actually violating the license that you have assigned to your uh, client. Sometimes so, there are non-competes. And if you're, if this is your area of expertise, you got to be careful what you're saying, agreeing not to write about in the future. Right. So bottom line, read your contracts and understand the terms or figure out what they mean if you don't understand. And tell us about the Authors Guild. Do you have um, resources to help people figure out contract terms? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, we have a template in book publishing agreement. And we have other agreements available on our website. But what we do at the Authors Guild is we help writers with the business of writing. And if you're a full member, we will uh, provide legal, legal services such as reviewing contracts, you can email us questions. We don't litigate for our members because we don't have the staff, have the staff to do so, but we can help refer you to outside organizations and people who can actually litigate for you. But so, yes, we can, and we've, we are, we've worked with journalists and groups of journalists at particular unnamed publications mm -hmm. in terms of saying these are the types of contracts that this uh, publisher is issuing and, and we think that these should be modified and we've tried and we've helped modify some language. Amazing. Great. Um, and I know the American Society for Journalists and Authors also has like a contract committee that can help with that. And um, Lawyers for Reporters does also provide great free legal advice and the Cyrus Van Center, some other resources just to throw out there. Um, so Maithili, I am very interested in this notion of liability insurance because, as I said, I negotiate all my contracts. So when clients have asked me to carry liability insurance, generally I've been able to get out of it because it's workers' comp and I have no employees, or it's you know worried that someone's going to trip on a cable to my video camera and I am a print journalist. But um, I now that I hear about it, I'm really interested. Can you talk about the specific policy you have and? Um, if also feel free to bring in Cheryl if there's terms or, or, or specific language that you think would be helpful for our audience to understand that you feel more protected against because of that policy. Yeah, um, so I, you know, I didn't really think about liability insurance earlier either until this particular client required it. Um, but now that I'm looking back, I'm like, oh, well, I was reporting on the Trump campaign quite a bit, and they're pretty litigious. And, you know, I was reporting on companies and press freedom rights and all these things. And I'm like, it kind of scared me that I didn't have this in place before. Um, but, you know, it's, at some point I was a staff reporter, so I was covered by my newspaper at that point. Um, but they were also based in the UK. So they had very different media laws in each country that we also had to navigate. Um, so that is also something to think about, depending on where you're based and where it's not just where you're working, but where your outlet is based. Um, and so, like, I think Cheryl had pointed that out before. 
But um, just to walk through people through what I had done, I went to the freelancers union. They have a partnership with a company called Hiscox. And it was an easy, like the, the client had actually suggested that I do that uh, because they had had other contractors do this a similar process. Um, and it seemed pretty easy to me. They already had a partnership with them. They were vetted. I didn't have to worry about going and finding another company. Um, so you go through the freelancers web uh, union website and it takes you to, to get your quote. Uh, essentially. So it's like any other insurance policy, they're going to give you a quote based on what you want covered. Um, and the first thing they offer you after you put in all your details is usually the uh, business owner liability insurance. And that is not something that I opted in for on my policy, because when I looked at the terms, a lot of it was like based on if you had an office space separate from your home. Um, and it was a lot of office space, I, you know, if someone slips and falls, if your equipment gets ruined, if, you know, you have like renters in your office space, like things, things that just didn't apply to me, but also things that were covered by my renter's insurance, because I rent an apartment in New York and my landlady requires me to have renter's insurance. So all, and I work from my primary business address is my apartment. Um, it's like 5% of my apartment. <laughs> so, you know, in that sense, like I am covered because I made sure that my renter's insurance covered all the spaces in my apartment for multiple uses. Um, so I, and you know, I do, I'm, a, I'm a print journalist. I only, I'm a writer. I don't do video or, or, you know, photography. So I didn't really have equipment besides my laptop. And my laptop is dual use. I use it for work and personal. So that's also covered by my renter's insurance. Um, so I didn't opt for that. But Hiscox also has what they call a cyber um, protection, cyber liability. And within that, it, it, it I didn't even look at it at first because I didn't really understand why they're calling it cyber. Um, but it, it seems like a little bit of an outdated term. But essentially what they're covering is anything you're putting on the internet. That's how I read it. Obviously, legally, Cheryl can speak more to that, but they do have a very specific digital media um, section. And when you go through and you look, you know, when they give you the quote, um, they, you know, you can get the, the terms before you sign on and it does cover dis digital media portions. And that was what my client was interested in because I'm writing and I'm working with journal other journalists outside of their institution, um, but it covers me as a contractor so that the institution doesn't get, isn't legally liable. Um, and so because I was working in that capacity, it, like the, the policy that I got for Hiscox covers all of the different um, aspects of my job with them. And um, it's also worked into my contract with the client. So they know that I have the liability insurance, they are accounting for it. I also asked for a raise in order to cover the cost <laughs> because it is expensive. I mean, that was going to be about, my question. Yeah, it's about $50 a month for me. And I'm, you know, I live in New York City, so it is going to be probably cheaper for those outside of New York, maybe. I'm not sure how they, the actuarial table on that works, but I am assuming that everything is overpriced <laughs> in New York. Um, and I live in Manhattan also, so, you know, take that into account. So it might be cheaper in your state or your city, um, but it is, you know, that is a significant expense. Um, that I would, you know, I can write it off on my taxes. I did ask my accountant about that. Um, but I also negotiated with my client to say, hey, I'm paying for this insurance. And they're like, well, we can't cover your insurance. I was like, that's fine. Just give me X amount more as like part of my, my you know, regular negotiating that I always do for every contract. Um, and then I made sure myself that I, that could cover the cost of this insurance. And I do just set it aside every month to cover it. Um, and I'm curious. So that is what kind of client mm -hmm. is that? Um, you know, is it a publication or a different organization? This is actually um, the City University of New York. Um, so they do require a lot of their contractors to have this kind of insurance, regardless of what department they're working in. I just happen to be working with the journalism school, and 
working with other journalists outside of, of the school um, and for the, you know, with other freelancers also. So yeah. just, it it's, it's to cover themselves, but also when I was looking at it, I was like, I should be covered too, in case I'm mentoring a reporter who works on a story that they get in trouble for. I'm also covered. And if I have to get a lawyer, if I have to be deposed or whatever, whatever crazy thing might happen. Um, and I, for me, I think I'm a lot of freelancers are in the same position. I do not have lawyer money <laughs> set aside. I have savings and I have retirement accounts and I have investments. I do not have a legal fund set aside. Um, so, you know, maybe some investigative reporters do. That's fantastic. But lawyers are expensive for good reason. Um, so I think this is like, yes, it is expensive every month, but it covers me in case something happens. And my policy covers, I think, up to 250000 um, is the, the coverage that they could provide. Um, and then there, there is a deductible if you have the business owner liability insurance. Um, so, you know, it depends on what you need. If you have an office outside of your home and you don't have homeowners or renters insurance, you might want that other piece of it also. Um, but since I'm already paying for renters insurance, I decided not to get that. Great. Um, but yeah, I think this is all like, it is like a, you know, hopefully you never have to use it, but it is good to have. <laughs> and can you talk, Cheryl, about what that means, you know, to be covered? You know, what's talk us through what it covers and maybe what it doesn't cover and what you potentially might experience regardless if you are the subject of a lawsuit. Okay, well, one thing that your policy nicely and many policies don't cover is if you intentionally uh, are doing wrong, if you're intentionally committing a crime or if you're defrauding somebody or presumably in a journalist situation, if you are intentionally making false statements, that's an intentional act and your insurer would uh, once learning that say, say that, that you're outside the policy, sorry. And I actually did have a question, but also to lead into a comment, Maitali, and I'm presuming that when you were applying for the policy, they offered you the option of, uh, are you going to take have a bigger deductible or a lower deductible, and your price was adjusted accordingly? And yes. that's something, yeah, yeah, because I think a lot of these do. And one of those things is that's your internal risk balancing, because it's certainly like you'll, you can pay less money on a monthly basis, but if you get hit, then you've got like a bigger deductible. So that's yeah. another way that you can try to manage, like, again, what is your appetite for risk and what is your appetite for your your monthly or annual outlay on your insurance policy? Um, um, and at this point in my career, my appetite for risk is quite low. So that's, <laughs> why, I'm lawyer, I extra, <laughs> yeah. that's why I'm paying a little extra a month um, because I wanted a lower deductible. I don't want to have to spend a lot. I don't want to think about it in case that happens. It's like reducing my own mental stress also. Um, and if I have to negotiate my contract to get a little bit extra money, that's not a bad thing either. Mm -hmm. um, so it worked out for me. Great. That's usually what happens if somebody will send you a letter uh, or if they don't send you a letter saying that you have done me wrong, stop it. They, they may just send you, file a, send you a complaint and they may just serve you and say, that, okay, I'm suing you for defamation, say. Uh, then what you have to do with your insurer is you have to get that claim to your insurer ASAP. Because also, if you don't give them sufficient notice, then they may go, oh, well, you didn't give us enough notice. Uh, we could have acted to dismiss this, whatever. It's like, sorry, our hands are tied. So you need to look at in terms of your policy to figure out what your obligations are to your insurer in terms of you, sometimes they will say that if you get a letter where you reasonably think that a lawsuit may be pending, then you got to send that letter on to them. You have to give them notice. So you got to send that on to the insurer and some insurance policies will, well, most will provide that they will get their, use their own lawyers. Uh, you may have some level of uh, be able to suggest if you happen to know a lawyer, uh, if that lawyer is on the insurer's panel of acceptable lawyers, you may say, hey, I've worked with us and such a lawyer in the past. Can you have them handle my case? And they may go, yes. And they may go, no, we don't know them. <laughs> then we want to use our own lawyers, which is also fine. And so what they will do is they will defend they will defend the action, and again it's a it's subject to your deductible with them, and there are some insurers I need to I hasten to point out that are risk averse themselves in terms of there are some insurers that 
if you state that you are uh, you tend to report on Fortune 500 companies, then they will say, nope, sorry, we're not going to cover you there. That's too high a risk for us. Uh, there are some insurers that may say, if you are an investigative journalist, uh, ooh, that looks risky. No, no, we're not going to cover you for that. If you're somebody who does uh, something that they deem lower risk, a writer who deems uh, reports on what they would deem lower risk subjects, then okay, we can cover that. Really interesting. And final question, because I want to get back to Raphael and talk about uh, financial risk and getting paid. Um, I have, as I said, tried to negotiate my way out of this. I do not have insurance as of this point, um, but I may very soon, <laughs> thanks to this webinar. I have sometimes asked a publication to add me as an additional insured on their media policy. Um, does that seem sufficient or would you recommend I ask to look at their policy because I wonder even just the experience of being sued, as you mentioned, Cheryl, may not come out of the blue. There may be sort of things leading up to it mm -hmm. uh, that you would need to take an additional step. Can you talk us a little bit through what it might look like for a freelancer or independent journalist if you are the subject, we're going to assume you didn't do anything intentionally bad. You didn't commit a crime, but someone's mm -hmm. upset with you and and they file a lawsuit. What are the steps in that process and why might we want to avoid them through uh, finding a way to protect ourselves? Well, first off, in terms of the it's a, I think that's a great option. If you can get the publisher to have you as an additional insured, that is great because odds are they're going to have they're the deeper pocket. And they're going to have more and more coverage and access to their their insurer will probably have also a bigger uh, panel of, of potential attorneys who can help defend you against that. And that's one in our our trade book contract our model contract. That's one of the, our suggest recommended line, recommended provisions is that the publisher should cover the author as an insured on their policy. And uh, then more often than not, then the uh, the publisher will try to have some sort of negotiation or pushback and say, well, but if we do that, then you have to have some skin in this game too. So you need to be responsible for, uh, say, the amount of the advance or whatever, uh, in terms of like how much we're going to compensate our lawyers and how much we're going to, how we're going to handle this. So in terms of that, uh, yes, if you're working with a publisher, then yes, you got to notify them ASAP if you get this information. And as a publisher, they're going to their their reputation is on the line, too. And you want to maintain good relationship with them. You want to be able to back up like this is how I got this information. This is how these are my records. These are my notes. Uh, this is why this is why I believe this is accurate. Uh, so you want to be working with them actively to defend against this case and to be, uh, so that their counsel can go back and say, like, look, uh, this is what this is, is not a false statement. Perhaps this is a misinterpretation of a statement. Perhaps, uh, God forbid, there's something happened in the editing process. And that's so then in which case the, it may be more the publisher's responsibility than the than the journalist. But so when you're working with a journalistic organization, yes, you want to be very closely involved with them and you want to have your insurance tied in with them as well. And you want to be privy to what's going on because you also don't want them to necessarily some necessarily settle something uh, for like I, they paid a half million dollars for something that you say like and that makes you look bad when you you can say like look I have every I have every right to defend this this is this is not right and you may but insurance policies often don't give you the ability to say no don't settle but you may be able when you're dealing with the publisher you may be able to try to negotiate with the publisher saying like look don't uh, all the, we've got a strong case like please don't settle for that much or settle it in a way that it makes it really 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 clear that there's you everybody when you're settling everybody denies wrongdoing anyway but you want to try to make it as clear as possible that there's no wrongdoing in the reporter's part so the more involved in the process you are the more you're able you're going to be able to take part in like the the press issuing the press release wrapping the press release to say that explain that this is the situation Wow, so many things to think about. Thank you, Cheryl. And uh, an argument for the job of fact checking, because I, you know, going back to what you said earlier about factual errors um, potentially being a cause of action for a lawsuit, um, it, it just makes it all the more important to keep track of our reporting as we're doing reporting so that we can always go back and say, this is how I know this. This is 
um, why I wrote what I wrote or, you know, put it on video or audio um, the way that I did. Um, can we talk, turn down to Raphael and talk? Oh, I just wanted to say one thing. Um, mm -hmm. With all the layoffs going on and all the media companies being acquired by other companies or, or like being acquired and then legally been disbanded or whatever the language is around that, um, there is an advantage of having your own insurance and not relying on the the media outlet to do it, to put you on their policy. Um, so there might be some, depending on what you work on and how you work, um, some of us are on long-term contracts with a few clients. Some of us do like a lot of one-off stories for different clients. So it it may not have made sense earlier in my career, but now it does make sense for me to do this. Um, so it just depends on on that, but there is some something to be said for covering yourself, yourself. <laughs> Interesting. Oh, yeah. I wanted to add when about your cybersecurity uh, policy, Maitali, uh, that it also covers people who do business on the internet. So essentially, if you've got a website and you're collecting, say, uh, subscriber information and personal data that may be hackable, um, if it's got business interruption, like if you're doing, again you're making business off your website and the website goes down and you don't you don't have income as a result, there are certain other elements that are covered under this policy that might not be obvious but might be very relevant to you as however you conduct your in your journalism and however you market your services. Interesting. Um, so I want to turn to Raphael, but I, we can come back to this and, and reminder that we will be turning to questions very soon. So please do put questions in the Q and a box and we will um, get to those soon. So Raphael, um, one of the most common risks that I also hear about when people hear that I'm a freelancer and have been a full-time freelancer for 15 years is, oh, isn't it hard not getting paid <clears throat> or don't you have to wait for payment? So that's definitely a risk is risk to our cash flow if we aren't paid or aren't paid in a timely way. Can you talk about the freelance isn't free legislation and who's covered by that and how to enforce your rights under freelance isn't free? That, definitely. Um, you know, the, the union back in 2015 found that over 76% of freelancers uh, deal with non-payment at least once a year. Uh, and no matter where you are along your journey, whether you're just first starting out or have you been doing it for 15 years, you might always encounter that client that's not paying you on time, maybe not paying you for, for all of the work you've completed. Just for example, most recently, a journalist friend of mine uh, was suing the New York Post because uh, they they underpaid them for the count of words that he provided and they printed. Um, so, you know, we we the union at the time worked with myself when I was a city council member uh, to help craft this legislation. And it was called the Freelancers and Free Act uh, in New York City in the five boroughs. Uh, now you are you have the right to a contract between yourself and a client. Uh, and within that contract, you have a right to be paid within 30 days. Uh, you also uh, have the right to call call the city of New York to step in uh, if the client does not pay you within that time frame, or if that client denies you a contract. Uh, you also are protected uh, from retribution from a client uh, if they decide not to work with you because they, pref they prefer for you not to have a contract in place. Uh, and, and all of those protections are available to you just simply by dialing uh, 311, uh, and they'll connect you to the, to the department of, of consumers and workers protection. Um, if if at the end of the process, right, the city of New York uh, is not able to push the client to pay you uh, on time, you're then able to go to small claims court uh, with, with the letter of, of proof from, from the city of New York, uh, sh showing that the city has also tried to step in to help remediate the situation and that they believe that you as a freelancer are due the amount that, that you're claiming you're able to sue uh, that client for, for double of what your original invoice was, and also for the, any attorney fees that you might incur in the process. Uh, so it's really a, was a law to, to go after probably the most basic issues that people have when, when completing work for another entity. Uh, unfortunately, freelancers don't have the same protections as, as if you were just an employee, where you're able to call the Department of Labor um, and they'll, they'll go after the employer so this, this law created that basic protection and we were able, and since then, and, and I, I would say 
uh, as bad as the pandemic was for 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 all independent workers, I think the silver lining was that it has opened up the eyes of legislators across the country uh, of the responsibilities they have now to uh, address the the gaps in, in protection and benefits that exist for independent workers. So uh, since 2020, we've been able to advocate for this law uh, to to be implemented in the city of Seattle, uh, in the city of Los Angeles, uh, in the city of Minneapolis, uh, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, and most recently, our most our biggest wins has has been our ability to take this this legislation statewide. So for the first time in this country's history, uh, we have two states uh, uh, that have the Freelancers and Free Act in place, and those are the states of New York and the states of Illinois. Uh, so if you're in Chicago or if you're anywhere in, in the state of New York, uh, you can you can count on this law being there to protect you. Um, uh, and again, it, it, it's a it's a simple requirement to a contract. And, and unfortunately, if you don't live in, in those states, in those cities, I mean, there are steps you can take as well, right? Uh, just make sure you have a contract in place when you're working with a client. Uh, if you're concerned about being paid at the end of that project, have milestones uh, put into that contract. For example, uh, maybe there's a deposit up front. Uh, maybe there's a payment uh, um, down the line through in the middle of the project. Then also at the end of the project, ha have that last payment be made. And those are the simple little protections, uh, little things you can do to protect yourself. And at the end of the day, you're still encountering problems. You can always reach out to the freelancers union. It's what we're here for. It, it is one of our main issues. Uh, and we and we like to intervene in your behalf and write the man letters and try to connect you to any legal representation that we might we, we feel is is affordable or, or rather free for you as well. Amazing. I mean, truly uh, visionary leadership, Raphael, to start in New York City. And it's great to see how it's spread across the country. And my understanding is if you have a client in New York City, even if you're not based there, you can still enforce your rights. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Um, New York City, I, I would say, still leads in, in, in that aspect of, of the law. New York City is the only city or jurisdiction in the country that allows for any freelancer, uh, whether you're based in New York City or you're working with the, or with a client based in New York City, uh, you're afforded those protections. You know, unfortunately, other other jurisdictions and states have not have not followed through and putting that uh, that certain uh, stipulation in, into the law. Uh, but in New York City, you do have that protection. Great. And I'm going to take questions from the audience right now because we have a lot. And then I have some of my own that have come up in my head as we were talking. Thank you all so much for this really informative conversation. Um, I think this is also for Raphael, but all three of you, if you have uh, advice, I was interested in how to navigate parental leave. Can you talk about disability insurance if you have an LLC that operates as an S Corp or um, maybe through Opolis, how that would work when it comes to parental leave? Yeah, um, I mean, cer certain states have parental leave um, uh, baked in. There are about 12 states um, that that have created a law and an opt-in for independent workers. Uh, and they do require you uh, to purchase a, like a short-term disability plan uh, in, in order to opt into those programs. So um, you would have to find the insurance carriers uh, that, that, provide, uh, that provide that insurance and, and purchase it. Uh, at the un at the union, we provide uh, you know long term disability plans uh, that are available to you. Uh, so we encourage you to look to look into into that as well. Um, but again, you know you would have to buy an insurance plan through a private insurer, uh, even if you're living in a state uh, that has par a parental leave uh, program adopted. Got it. And do you happen to know if Opolis provides uh, access to a short term disability plan through their insurance options? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, is, is, uh, Apolis uh, opens you up to all of, to all of those benefits that a traditional employee would get. So, because you're you're paying it out of your payroll, uh, you're you're able to access those those states those state benefits for sure. Yeah, and I actually I when I did the intake to get my own information for my personal self, um, he even said you can fire yourself as an employee of the LLC and collect unemployment. Yeah, so I mean, there, there's, there's, there's a situation that you, which you might end up unemployed, right? Um, uh, within the program, um, you know, you do, you, depending on the state you live in, you do have to keep a certain income coming in every year. Uh, but if you don't, if you don't meet that income for a certain amount of months, uh, they, they will have to terminate you as an employee from, from the platform. But the, what that termination allows you to plot to apply for unemployment insurance within your state, right? So if you're in a situation where you're not meeting those income goals because you um, 
uh, I don't know, maybe you had a family situation, maybe maybe you've gotten sick, uh, maybe you're having trouble securing new clients. Um, it really opens you up the opportunity to to get that secure income put in place as, as you try to get back back yourself, get yourself back on your feet. Amazing. Um, another question for the Authors Guild. Um, Cheryl, do you know if the Authors Guild works with audio journalists? Uh, last time this person checked, they didn't. Has that changed? Can anyone be a member? My understanding is that we probably would. I don't know the specifics of what this person was advised, but there are there are membership requirements. Like you have to be, if you're like a self-published person, and I presume if you're publishing audio podcasts or however you act as an audio journalist, uh, there would be certain financial requirements in terms of like, you have to make X out of it as a self-published journalist to be able to be eligible. Um, but certainly, I mean, we've got um, we've got emerging categories of of authors. We've got student authors. We've got people in the published publishing professionals in the industry. So I would think there would be some way in which an audio journalist could be a member. So I know we've got members who do podcasts and things like that. Great, thank you. Um, another question: the IP language and work for hire contract seems a minefield. I agree. Say I cover a court case for a news outlet. The case is over. The defendants are sentenced. If I've signed a work for hire contract for the stories or you know reporting I turned in, can I never write about these people again because I wrote about the trial? You can write about them again. It's a public event. You can still write about them. However, uh, your odds are your notes, uh, your work product would probably be owned by the employer. So. Your ability to use that work product would be limited and maybe it's possible you might be able to get the employer to agree to let you use your work product uh, for, for other purposes. Uh, so if you've got a work for hire contract, that's something that you do, you do need to bear in mind because if they you don't want them to be able to say like, hey, you're just taking your article you wrote for us and making it into a book. You can't do that under the agreement. Like, no, you can't. But if you if you were willing to do some additional digging more than so than you did with them, they don't own that. Great. And a question from Maithali. How do you decide what is in your coverage when you're purchasing liability insurance? What was the ballpark number that gave you comfort? Um, I didn't have a particular number in mind um, because I... I wasn't going to get this contract unless I had the insurance and I really needed the contract at the time. So I, you know, I wasn't going to pay hundreds, hundreds of dollars a month, but anything under that, I would consider it. Um, and like Cheryl was pointing out, they do ask you what your risk level you want it to be. So but when I had the first iteration of this policy, I just, I actually just renewed it. Um, I, my deductible was much higher because I was like, okay, I can't, I don't want to pay this much per month. Now I'm like, okay, I can afford to pay a little more a month and my deductible can be lower. Um, so it just, it depends on what you, you can change it based on, on how you're doing in your, in terms of your client list and income. Um, so, and I think it's important to do that also just for your own sake. Um, but yeah, it, I didn't have a particular number, but I knew from what I was going to make for the rest of that quarter, I based it on that. Um, and you know, we all pick up assignments as the year goes on, but based on, on the last two quarters, I always base it on, on, on those numbers just so that, cause that's usually my baseline. Um, but it, it's going to vary for everybody. I yeah. Think. Cheryl, do you have any ballpark of the rough cost of a defense against libel or defamation. I mean, in my mind, I'm always thinking $140 million that Gawker <laughs> was was uh, asked to pay for Hulk Hogan's, uh, you know, uh, lawsuit and that brought down, you know, a media organization. So mm -hmm. that's the fear. Uh, but is there a, and any way to get a sense of what is the dollar amount you might have to pay if there were some kind of even frivolous lawsuit? Well, even if you have a frivolous lawsuit, the attorneys still need to be paid. Unless, as a journalist, you may be able to get pro bono representation from somebody who's willing to take on your cause. That will depend. Uh, and there are times when people use lawsuits as an interim tactic. And there's this whole thing, slap, uh, 
anti-slap lawsuits where if a lawsuit is clearly brought as a matter of uh, as a matter of to try to stay in stem speech there are laws that essentially can help nip those not necessarily nip them in the bud but enable them to be dismissed relatively easily and put a cap on your on your legal fees so if you can say that like if donald trump sues you kind of thing saying well this is clearly a political matter and he's not suing me because i've said something false but because of his political ambitions then it's like okay that's a slap lawsuit it's a strategic lawsuit against i forget the what the pps are for um, but so there and there's like statutes that provide for when you can dis you can move to dismiss those on an expedited basis and limit your limit your damages accordingly. So there's that kind of thing. But if you're talking about how much just I would say easily you you, you get into the six figures very easily uh, in, in terms of like if you're you're having back and forth, there's a complaint. You've got discovery. God, if you enter into discovery and you've got to go through documents and depose people, those numbers rack up very, very quickly. Yeah. So it's a, a lot of times people will try to move to dismiss things or on a, as soon as they can, and then they'll come to the table. Right. And I believe the Lisa Kwan uh, lawsuit was a slap lawsuit. So even though it was dismissed, she still ended up with more more than 10,000, but mm -hmm. not 140. It could have been so much more. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so we have a ton of questions. I'm hoping to do just quick, quick answers. Um, I'm glad we got this question because I think there's a lot of misconception about operating an LLC. If you're a one member LLC, does that give you any additional protection against the types of risk we've been talking about, libel, for, you know, defamation. Um, you know, some people think, oh, well, that's a shield. I don't need to worry about being sued. Anyone who'd like to take it. It is a limited shield because I was actually going to say one of the great things about what, this Opolis uh, organization, Rafael, is one of the things that people do is they, they create uh corporations say great i'm free from liability and then they don't follow the corporate procedures and protocols and then people pierce the corporate veil saying this isn't a real corporation you're just using it as a tactic but it sounds like opolis is a way that people can have legitimate corporate structure and thereby they're not mean they're not commingling their personal and their and their corporate funds it's a way of making say this is a real corporation and so that's a, that is a way that it can provide you with some protection and enhanced protection if you are treating it, in fact, as a real corporation. And you probably, as a, as a regular person, are going to need help, <laughs> an accountant, uh, with somebody to so make sure that you are keeping track of your of your corporate records and documents, and you're abiding by what your obligations are to maintain your being a real corporation. I mean, my understanding was that as a journalist operating an LLC, someone might sue me individually for my actions as a, you know, as a journalist, in addition to being an officer of the corporation. So it really doesn't protect you that much. You can be sued as a, you're a separate professional. You're right. So they, it's not necessarily the action of the corporation. It's the action of the individual. But if you've got your assets in, turn, <laughs> in the corporation, those assets may be able to be protected, but again, got it. it's got to be legit. Got it. Amazing. Another quick question. I'm an audio producer and need liability insurance to protect me if someone trips over a mic cable, et cetera, if I'm on location. <laughs> Any suggestions how to start getting that insurance? Well, we, we offer, as mentioned earlier, Hiscox uh, to the Financial Union. It, it is uh, liability protection for folks in a lot of different industries, and uh, it's very possible that uh, their professions is covered. And can you talk about the difference between an umbrella policy and, um, you know, business liability and errors and emissions insurance? How do you, how do those different terms break down? It's a good question. I, I would have to go back and check. Now, errors and emissions that generally are kind of in the name. It's like, if you make, a, if you have a factual error, if you make a misstatement, if you do something incorrect, um, and also, I think they may also cover copyright infringement and trademark infringement as well, probably comes under your E&O policy. Um, general commercial is, with the, the, the Authors Guild and just businesses tend to have general commercial liability policies, which will cover like slip and falls in the office and things like that. Right. Okay, great. And um, with Hiscox, you can add um, different items to your policy as well. 
before you, you know, before they give you a quote. So there is an option. I mean, when you're going through the, the freelancers union um, partnership, they do offer like two options. It's the business owner liability and the cyber. But I think if you call them and talk to them, they have other options as well, um, just depending on what you need. There are also different types of types of insurance called claims made versus occurrence policy. And the there can be different pricing on those. Claims made is essentially say you're covered over the course of a year. You're, that means claims made, you're covered for claims made during the course of that year. Occurrence policy means that even like several years down the road, if you get sued for something that happened during that year, you would still be covered under this because that's when the when the issue arose. Um, but there's going to be different levels of cost in terms of like those different types of policies. And some call some insurance companies may not offer you and may may not offer you the type of the either a current occurrence made or you may not be able to afford it. And actually, that brings me to the question of tail insurance, Cheryl, like mm -hmm. what Mice said earlier, if you work for a media company and maybe they had you on their policy and then they close and go bankrupt and do not exist anymore, um, can you buy a separate tail insurance policy to cover that or should you or are you covered because at the moment you did the project, you were insured? That depends on if it's a claims made or an occurrence policy. Um, so our tail would really it would really be an essentially an extension of the company's policy. So I don't think I'm not certain, but I wouldn't think that an individual could purchase a tail on a company's policy. But if they look into what the, because some people some companies pay for tail coverage even for like a year or so after the policy expires to give people time because sometimes you're not necessarily things are in the pipeline. For a period of time, you may be here, gotten notice that something may be arising on the last day of your policy. But if you've got coverage, say, okay, so we've got time to like still make sure that we've got to see if we get, you know, we got to save with a complaint within 30 days or whatever. And then send it to the insurance company and say, okay, we're still covered, right? But so, yeah, tail coverage is an extension, but I would say check with your, on your, on your employer's policy. Because sometimes, and often, I can't say often, but sometimes they will already have a tail incorporated into that so you may still be covered for a period of time even after they're no longer doing business amazing um rafael most cities and states sadly do not yet have a freelance isn't free act do you or anyone else have advice on how to push for those kinds of protections in our own locations yeah definitely i mean that that is the work we're currently doing uh you know we are going state state by state city by city uh, trying to find interested interested uh, local elected officials and also advocacy groups. Uh, so it really comes down to old fashioned organizing. Um, so if, if you're willing to get involved, uh, please reach out to us. Uh, we have a, a, at our email address, advocacy at freelancersunion.org. Uh, and uh, our team will, will work with you to try to build a coalition locally to push your local officials to, to get this law passed. And I just, I just want to shout out also the Authors Guild who have been part of that coalition uh, in, in, in those efforts as well. So uh, stay in touch with organizations like ours. Um, you know, feel free to reach out to us and, and we'll definitely put the work in to get these laws passed in your jurisdiction. jurisdiction. Great, and I know uh, um, some uh, colleagues I know from ASJA are also involved with uh, Fight for Freelancers USA, I believe. Um, so they also are a great um, partner in this work. Um, I don't know, Raphael, if you know about parental leave, if you have to be on official payroll to be eligible, and if so, for how long? And if you don't know, we can just move on. Yeah, I mean, um, on the, in the state plans, you don't, right? You uh, just, just follow the self-employed um, individual, and you're able to buy into those programs, um, uh, again, going through the insurance policies that, that the states are, are offering or recommend for you to buy into. Um, I also saw a question about uh, whether or not how long it takes it take how long does it take for you to qualify for parental leave if you buy into these programs. I do have to caution you: a lot of insurance companies do look at as pregnancies as like pre-existing conditions. Um, so if you're planning on having a family, uh, I, I, I uh, recommend you do it uh, at least a year before uh, you you start planning. And I'll just, wait, I just Googled and found this, but it looks legit that uh, 13 states and DC do have these, uh, you know, uh, paid family leave systems. And um, so that's something just to do some research, which we all can do as reporters. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I do a lot of destination travel writing, not me, but the questioner, and mm -hmm. also product reviews, travel, outdoor home, etc. How does that work regarding copyright? Can a publisher come after me for writing about a different angle of the same destination that I covered elsewhere or with product reviews, including the same product in a roundup elsewhere? Well, copyright would cover the actual, your actual writing, the actual article you've written for them. Uh, so if you are not using that article, uh, making a derivative work, like making a, a sequel, even like a sequel to that, well, first off, who, who owns the copyright in that original article? Is it you or is it your client? If you own the copyright, then hey, go for it. If you're, if it's a work for hire, or if you transfer the copyright to the publisher, uh, then yeah, you have to look at to make sure that you're not just taking this article and 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 massaging it into a different form, say, and republishing it elsewhere because that can get you into trouble and that would be deemed a derivative work. If you're using it as an idea, uh, as a concept for another article, then that's not uh, forbidden under the copyright law. Ideas are not protected under copyright. Yeah. So I would it it it's and my legal answer, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> Ideas are our business. I I yeah. say we sell them all all day long. And when I first started freelancing, it was during the Great Recession and I was covering the Dodd-Frank legislation. And I wrote an article about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau for Financial Planning Magazine, for the bank rate publication, for uh, fiscal times and for fortune, right? I Because I had an expertise on that topic and what was happening in Congress, I wrote about that topic for all these publications. Um, in addition to, to protecting yourself against a lawsuit, you also want to protect yourself against your editors getting really pissed off at you. So I always made sure that if I was writing about a topic I covered for someone else that everyone knew. Right. Uh, I would say, hey, I wrote about this for fortune, but I thought a different angle for your audience might be useful. So it's not just about like protecting yourself from a lawsuit. It's you know, want to protect your flow of future work from that client. You know, <laughs> you don't want them to see that you wrote about something and and get upset. Um, a final question in the chat, and then I have some of my own, um, which was directed at Cheryl, but anyone. Um, can you explain what indemnification is? If a publication requires it, is it better to insist on mutual indemnification? These clauses seem to be propping up with more frequency. Uh, yes, indemnification is essentially, you have to make somebody whole. That if they get sued as a result of what you wrote, then you need to, you need to make them whole. You need to reimburse them. Um, and yes, we would always recommend that it be mutual because you may and you the what the suit may be responsible as a result of something you did but what if the publisher has made an error or if they're they're the ones who are causing this lawsuit to be brought they should indemnify you as well so i we always believe that these things should be fair so i think if they're saying that i authors got to indemnify me and say okay well first off we like to as a lawyer i like to limit those uh say that when there's like a finding an adjudication or whatever try to carve back as much as you can for indemnification. Indemnification for things that I did wrong, as opposed to somebody sued because they're mad. They, you know, I indemnify you to the extent that I violated the terms of my agreement and infringed upon somebody's rights. So I'd always try to get that language in there. But um, yes, it should also be mutual because I mean, it's there, they, the lawsuit maybe is a result of what the publisher's done. Great. Um, I do have another question from Mithili. Um, I want to encourage the person who put something about health insurance to expand because it's a broad topic, but we'd happy to be happy to talk about it if you give us more specifics about what you want like to know. Um, Mithili, you're so active in the journalism community. I'm curious when you're in conversation with other freelancers, what have you found are some common misconceptions about insurance and risk or oversights when it comes to protecting yourself? I think, I mean, it depends on the type of insurance. I know like you and I have talked about liability insurance and it really only comes up when we hear about something horrible that's happened to somebody else and they've gotten caught owing a ton of money. Um, or if we know like a lawyer who has brought it up and, you know, for me it was because a client needed it or required it, but it was also because I was having conversations with friends I had worked with at law firms and they were like, what do you mean you're not covered? You cannot afford me. 
please get insurance. <laughs> um, and I mean, they're right, but still. Uh, but yeah, I think also, you know, it's good that we're having this webinar because I think this could be a starting point for the conversation with for everyone in attendance. Um, in terms of health insurance, I feel like you can never, you can't afford not to pay it. I think that's where that line is drawn, especially if you are getting, I mean, all of us are getting older, you know, we're all in, and we're not in journalism because it's like a peaceful, happy profession. Like this is stressful <laughs> most of the time. Um, and that does lead to health effects, whether we want it to or not. So I think it's, you can't, even a like a, what is, I can't remember the name of it, but it's like a oh, cat catastrophic policy. Mm. Those are like the cheapest ones you can get from the marketplace in any state. I recommend that you set aside money for that every month, even if it's cutting into your income and you can't afford to like travel or whatever, just please pay for your health insurance somehow. Or if you're under 26, you can get on your parents or legal guardians, or if you have a partner, you know, I recommend having some sort of health insurance available. Um, I know for me, like the older I got, the more I pay because I'm upgrading my plan every year um, because A, I, I need to dedicate that money to the health insurance, but also it gives me a little more peace of mind um, in case something happens. So, you know, I just, I think it's one of those things that you can't afford not to pay. Um, in terms of like other types of insurance, yeah, like maybe you don't need traveler's insurance if you're traveling, if you're like on the campaign trail or if you're going around the world, you know, doing reporting. I had it because I'm a little paranoid about that stuff. Um, but I wouldn't, you know, at first I wasn't getting it on every trip because I knew people who lived in that country or I, you know, it was a place that I was really familiar with that I'd been to many times before. And I was like, it's fine. Um, but you know, if, once I started going to places I wasn't as familiar with, it made a big difference for me in terms of just having that security. Um, and there is something to be said about that. It, le it lessens your mental load a little bit. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's like, it depends on the type of insurance, but for me, the baseline was health insurance. Like you have to have that in yeah. some capacity. It doesn't have to be the fanciest policy, but like it covers your ambulance cost or something, you know? Yes. Thank you so much. I think that's a great note to end on because it does depend, but you know, your situation best and weighing the risks and the real, you know, potential worst case scenario is how we'll all find the path through. Thank you so much to our speakers. I cannot believe how much we packed into 75 minutes. I want to give each person just an opportunity to share one final thing. If you have anything else you'd like to say to an audience of freelance journalists, Raphael. Um, just want to thank the IIJ for putting this together. Um, it, it's super important that uh, we come together in, in conversations like this uh, as a community uh, for, for many reasons, whether it be because it helps us advocate on the ground or whether because it allows us to help other freelancers who are also looking for help. So I encourage everyone to continue supporting organizations like ours. Uh, we're here to serve you, support you, and, and make sure that the protection's in place so you can have a fruitful career as a freelancer. Wonderful. Cheryl? So uh, ditto, thanks for inviting us here. Always think of the Authors Guild. We are literally here to help authors. <laughs> that is in the name, that is what we do. Um, but also I would suggest by way of trying to assess risk to understand, like read your contracts and read your insurance policies. Because I, I know that when I understand what I'm signing and what I'm, this is, if this happens, then what? Then I think that's that makes me feel better. Like, okay, at least I'm knowingly assuming risk as opposed to thinking, oh, I'm, I'm covered by an employer. No, maybe you're not. Great. And Maithali, anything you'd like to add? Um, make use of resources. IIJ is amazing. They have great webinars all the time. Um, Authors Guild, Freelancers Union, they're literally here to help us. Uh, and, you know, we have a little more latitude in like versus staffers in, in taking part in all these different types of resources. So you're not alone, even though you work alone. Um, and also always negotiate your contracts to cover these extra things that we have to pay for by ourselves always negotiate because, you know, they're not going to pay for it, but it doesn't mean that they won't give you money that you can use to pay for it. So, yeah. 
Great messages. Thank you so much, Rafael Espinal, Cheryl Davis, Maithili Sampath Kumar. We so appreciate your time and expertise and being in community with us. This is our last webinar until September because the IAJ, we're done with our conference, we're done with this webinar, and we're soon going to be going on the road to annual conferences for over the summer. We'll be at AAJA, NABJ, NAHJ, IJA, formerly known as the Native American Journalists Association, ONA, NLGJA, and potentially more. So please stay in touch with us in Tuesday's newsletter. We will be talking, um, have a call for volunteers to start planning next year's conference. And we're also looking at launching new products and um, initiatives to support the community. So please um, look for those in Tuesday's newsletter. Thank you all for being here and we'll see you soon.